And welcome everybody to another wonderful CCNA Sunday. My name is Keith Barker. It is so great to have you here. I absolutely look forward to each and every one of our live streams as we tackle many of the topics in the world of CCNA in this live stream. And today we're going to focus on IPv6 and static routing of IPv6. It's a great topic and there's a lot to talk about. So let's start off with a question. And based on your answer, we'll do it the way you'd like. Uh, I had a packet tracer video, or we did a wireless LAN controller using packet tracer, and I got a lot of good feedback saying, hey, Keith, thank you. Uh, I like being able to follow along, load up packet tracer on my own, get the hands-on practice, and it had more questions that followed too. So I thought what we could do today is I could, let's, let's do this. We're going to use packet tracer today because I want to share that with you and show you how it can be done. But my question is this, regarding IPv6 static routing, with packet tracer so you can do the hands on yourself my question is for you do you want to start with a base topology already in place where i can just go ahead and walk through and talk about static routes on that or similar to our wireless land controller video would you prefer to have it where we build the whole th thing from scratch we just design it and build it from scratch and that way you can follow along so if you would i'll just take the first few comments i see in the queue here in just a moment but just go ahead and comment uh from scratch or from nothing or with a pre-made topology, either way you want to go. And then uh, I'll look at the queue here in a moment and see what your the majority of the responses are. So IPv6 routing, sometimes it's scary to people because like, oh, look at those, those big addresses, so much going on. But really a network, whether it's IPv6 or IPv4, it's a street name. So, you know, if you have A street or B street or C street, you know, with IPv6, they look a little longer. So they might be more intimidating because they look longer, but still just a network ID. It's the name of a street, the name of a network. And okay, yeah, it looks like everybody wants me to start with a pre-built topology. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, everybody's saying from scratch, from scratch, from scratch. So that's what we'll do. So with that in, with that in mind, let's go to a, white, uh, a chalkboard and let's draw out a plan that way I have a chance to think about it myself <laughs> and we'll put a we'll put a plan together and then we'll implement that plan using packet tracer and IPv6 and then we'll add after we have the base topology in place that we build together from scratch we'll build the IPv6 static routing and one of the things that I earlier today I was doing a little re rehearsal meaning I was practicing with some gear and with IPv6 routes and it wasn't working I thought what's not working here why isn't this working? I was getting really tricky. I, I'm tricky. I was doing static routes and floating static routes as backups. And I killed the link and I, my floating static route came into the routing table just like it should. We've talked about static routes previously in some uh, videos. And I thought, why is, this, why is this no longer working? And then I put on my hat and I said, let me take this one step at a time. And I troubleshot it. And I thought, oh yeah, I did that. I caused this problem. And so we'll Depending on how deep we go today, we might have that problem again based on our new topology. But I want to share with you that when we're troubleshooting or when we're solving network problems or designing networks, it's important to verify as you go. And then if something doesn't work, investigate why, solve it, document it, and continue to move forward. All right. So having said all that, let's put a plan in place. And I'm excited. I'm very excited because I, I, I remember when I was first getting into networking, it was back... I got into IT in 1985-ish, and then I started networking like a year or two after that. One of my mentors, somebody I really look up to still, his name is David Nelson. And that was back in the days when we had coax cable with 10 base 2. 10 base 2 means 10 megabits per second baseband, and the coax could go approximately 200 meters. I think that was, the, uh, that was what the 2 was all about. In any event, I really admired uh, his ability to do networking back in those early days. And I always enjoyed, you know, as I started learning, designing networks and bringing them up from scratch and it's fun. So this, this chalkboard opportunity for me is like play and let me bring up a pen so I can play appropriately. And let me do this and let me get a color and we'll use, uh, let's start off with, let's see, let's start off with some routers. There we go. Let's have three routers and <laughs> as I'm trying to think why my colors aren't showing up. Hold on a second here. Hmm. Oh, I see. You're supposed to put the layer above. So I have a chalkboard layer 
and, and this layer I was writing on is below that. So let me erase, uh, let me, let me delete that layer and add a new one. Okay. It's like nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. All right, here we go. All right, so we need some routers. Let's go ahead and let's use one of my favorite routers, router one. Router and I, router one and I go way, way back. And then we'll have down here, let's have router two. And over here we'll have, any guesses? <laughs> yeah, you might be saying, Keith, that's gonna be router three, I bet. I think you're right. Okay, so there's our three routers. Now, one of the, th one of the questions we wanna ask ourselves when we're putting networks together for practice is, do we want switches involved? Yes or no? Now, if you're practicing trunking and VLANs and everything else, you want switches in between your routers. But if you're just doing just basic routing, you can do connections between routers directly and not have to worry about the switches. So totally up to you. But in this case, we're not doing any kind of um, switch technology, layer two stuff. We're just gonna focus on IP routing, IPv6 routing. So let's go ahead and put a fast connection and for fast, let me go ahead and bring up a color for that. Let's say green represents a fast connection. And let's put a fast connection here between R1 and R3. And we'll use gigabit interfaces. So we'll, for gigabit, we'll color green, meaning it's fast. And let's also do gigabit here. And I don't know what the port numbers are going to be yet because we might use the auto connect tool and packet tracer. And also, I'm not sure what modules we're gonna put in the routers, we'll do that too. So we'll put the actual port numbers on after we know what ports they are. And then to make this interesting, let's go ahead, go ahead and use a smaller, a slower connection between R1 and R2. And for that, let's use a color like yellow, which represents, yeah, let's use yellow, which represents slow. I'll even draw it slow. So the yellow, so think of a green light, yellow light, red light. Red light meaning not going anywhere. Yellow means slow or speed up if you're in Las Vegas. And then uh, green means fast. So this represents a, a serial connection. It could be a T1, like 1.54 megabits per second or something, moderately slow. And let's also put some clients off of here. We need some clients. Let's use, let's use a nice blue color for our clients. So up here, let's put a server hanging off of R1. Now, we don't have to put switches in place. If you're connecting two like devices, meaning two routers or two PCs or a router or a PC, you don't have a switch, you can use a crossover cable. A crossover, let me go with the big screen. A crossover cable simply allows the, there's four wire, wires in unshielded twisted pair that are used for signaling. And two are for sending, two are for receiving. And so if we're connected to a switch, we use a straight through cable and the switch is expecting to talk to an end device. Like the switch is expecting to talk off its switch port to a router, a PC, some other device that's not a switch. And if we have two devices that are like each other, like two switches or two PCs or two routers, we can use a crossover cable, which basically takes pins one and three and two and six, it crosses them over inside the, inside the cable. So that way you can actually have those back to back. So when you have two like devices, use a crossover cable and you have uh, like a switch and a router or two devices that would normally connect together like a switch and almost anything else, you'd use a straight through cable. And so we can do that in Packet Tracer too. I just wanna point out that those options exist and we can or can't have, we don't have to have an actual switch in these environments for that reason. So we'll use the right cables here. And that's off of R3. Let's go ahead and put another device here. And over here we can have, like, let's do a laptop, a little variety. And over here we use uh, like a PC. And for addressing, let's plan the addressing too. It's gonna be IPv6. <laughs> so we have a lot of IP address numbers to play with, but for the last grouping of numbers on, the, on the, each of these end devices, just for me, let's go ahead and use 10, 10, 10. And these are gonna be different networks. So they'll be the host ID will be a whole bunch of zeros and a 10 for that very last number for IPv6. And for these connections here, Let's, let me put this in white for our IPv6 addresses. So for our global plan, let's use, I'll put it right here. How high is my face? There's my face. Let's use 2001 DB8 6783 colon colon, and then we'll have R, R, colon, colon, R. <laughs> what the heck does that mean? Well, 2001 DB8 is a, 
a reserved IPv6 address, a globally routable address, that's supposed to be sort of documentation. So if you ever see 2001 DB8, is somebody who's drawing out an IPv6 address that'll never be used in production because that one is reserved there for uh, documentation purposes. Although it's still routable, still works. And then I have for this grouping, this these bits here, these 16 bits, uh, 6783 just for fun. If you've been with me for a few sessions, you know what that means. And then RR, I want the router number. So I will circle that. Let me just highlight it in a slightly different color. How about, let's go ahead and use this. So that RR there is gonna re represent the routers. So between R1 and R2, I always go from lower to higher, just <laughs> not because it's subnetting, but because that way when I look at topology in a lab, I can say, oh, I know exactly where that network is. So for that, that number right there in the IPv6 network address, so the first 64 bits of this address is the network, I'm gonna go ahead and this is gonna be network 12. So it'd be 2001 DB8 6783 12 colon colon slash 64. That'd be the network ID here. And then over here between R1 and R3, it'd be 13. And then here between R2 and R3, I'm gonna use, any guesses there? <laughs> any guesses on what we'd call for this section of the IPv6 network address between R2 and R3? If you're saying, Keith, yeah, I got it. It's gonna be 23. And that's how you can keep your sanity when you're learning new things, is building a topology, and in Packet Tracer, it only takes a few clicks, and then using IP addresses where it's not just an Easter egg hunt, like, wh where's that address, or where's that coming from? We can look at that portion of the IPv6 address and say, I know exactly where that network is. And furthermore, for these networks here, off of R1, R2, and R3 respectively, for that grouping right there, let's go ahead and call it one here. <laughs> so it'd be, you know, basically a whole bunch of zeros and a one for that section of the IPv6 address. And then here, let's call it two. And over here, let's call it three. So for example, down here, it'd be 2001 DB8 6783 three. That would be the network ID and then colon, colon, slash 64, representing it's a 64-bit network. And the mask works the same way it did for IPv4. So we have 128 bits, and with the mask identifies with the bits on, which bits are being used for the actual network, and where the bits are off in the mask, it means those bits are available for host addressing. And in this topology, we're gonna split it right down the middle, 50-50. Okay, so that's our plan so far. Let me see if we need to plan on anything else. Oh, let's, let's chat for a moment about addresses. So in IPv6, they're 128 bits long. Uh, if we have a 64-bit network, it would look like this, 2001 DB8. Oh, my pen's all messed up. Hold on a second. We're gonna use a slash notation. I'm gonna shortcut it. So if we do a, do a slash 64 at the end of the IPv6 address, that means the mask is 64 bits on, meaning the network is 64 bits long. And in IPv4, we'd call that CIDR notation, classless interdomain routing, just using a slash number as opposed to a dotted decimal mask. <laughs> there is no dotted decimal mask option for IPv6. It's always gonna be a slash and then the number of bits that are on in the mask. So in this case, we're gonna use a slash 64 everywhere and if you ever see an IPv6 address that begins with two anything, I'll put X's here as variables, through three anything, that's an example of an IPv6 routable address on the internet. And it's just, that's a lot. That's a lot of options there, followed by the rest of the IPv6 address. So if it starts with two anything in that first position or three anything in that first position, and it has three characters following it, doesn't matter what they are, zeros or Fs or anywhere in between, those are globally routable IPv6 addresses. And if we see something like this, if it starts with FE80, anything, <laughs> what that represents is a link local address. Now, if you're new to IPv6, I'd like to take a moment and share with you what that means, why, why we even care about that. So a globally routable IPv6 address is a lot like a globally routable IPv4 address. Routers can see the IP layer three address and they can make forwarding decisions based on it. This address, which I will put here as LL, is a link local address, meaning it's only good, it only works on the individual link where it's configured. So what we would see is once we configure R1 on this interface, it's gonna have an IPv6 global address that we assign to it and it's also going to manufacture for itself 
a link local address that it can use just on that local segment, and it can use that to communicate with other devices on that local segment, such as uh, if we're doing routing protocols, <laughs> they're actually using behind the scenes that link local address to forward frames and so forth to each other and the packets to each other. So think of the link local address as a second layer three, don't, it's not a layer two address, a second layer three address that IPv6 uses. And if you don't configure it, it comes free, free by default, meaning I didn't ask for it. Yeah, you didn't ask for it. But if you put an IPv6 global address on an interface, it will automatically come up with its own link local address. And it uses a really funky format for that called a EUI64, which uh, we'll talk about that later if you want to, but it comes up with its own address if you don't assign it. So if we wanted to, we could assign the global address to an interface. So on this interface right here, it'd be 2001db86783, and it would be 12. And then for the last number, we'd use the router number of one. So it'd be 2001db86783, 12, colon, colon, and then the final, I'm gonna add a colon there. <laughs> then the final router number. Uh, for that space. And then for the link local address, we could also assign that. And so we could assign it FE80 colon colon one if we wanted to. And on R2, we could assign FE80 colon colon two or any address that wasn't in use on that local link if we wanted to hard code those. So those are options. We'll see how we feel when we get to the interface. But I wanted to point out what those are. And then, uh, wow, we could just go on for hours. We, we may go on for hours, but I want to get this up and running for you so you can actually do this hands-on and get a good start with it. One other address type that I'd like to talk with you about, and that is a multicast address. And those start in IPv6 with FF. So if it starts with FF, like Fox Fox, it's written there. I guess I don't need to say it. But if it's written, it starts with FF, that's a multicast address. Now what is, let's talk about, let's talk about what a multicast address is. In the world we live in, there's a lot of receivers that need to receive data. And when we talk about IPv4 or IPv6 unicast, what that means is we have one sender, like a server, and one receiver, like a client, and that traffic is going from that one device to the other device. End of story, that's unicast, one. We're sending that traffic, that data to one device. Well, Keith, isn't that how the whole thing works? Well, no. <laughs> so that's how most of the traffic that we that we use works. However, there is an IP version four, a thing called a broadcast. Think of an ARP packet, like PC1 needs to figure out with IPv4, it needs to find out the layer two address of its default gateway. So it sends a broadcast into the VLAN saying, boom, everybody, I need to, if you're my default gateway's IP address, please send me back your layer two address. So that's a broadcast. That's a one to all, that's a broadcast. And what a multicast is, it's a one to many, but not all. And here's how it goes. Let's imagine that in this room right now, we have over 100 people as of right now. We have, maybe some of you are sports fans, and maybe some of you are gonna watch, uh, uh, well, gosh darn, we're in the middle of a pandemic and everybody's shutting down their, their shows and, and games. But let's imagine that, that part of us in this room are really interested in a certain team. And so what we do is we turn into the radio channel or the TV station that gives us information about our team. And we listen to that while other people in this same room right now don't care about that team. I'm sorry, they don't. So what happens is with, in that situation, we have a broadcast of that team or news about that team that's going to a group of people who are interested in hearing it while at the same time, the people who don't care about it have not tuned in. That's exactly how multicast works. With multicast, we have one sender who's pumping out content, and then we have groups, they call them groups, of individuals on the network or on multiple networks, but on the network that don't want to tune in, and they're listening, and they listen to that information. So if there's 100 devices, and 20 of them want to listen in or tune in, they can tune in to a specific multicast group, think of it like a, a, a specific address, and then they receive that information, they process it, and that's a one-to-many. That's how multicast works, both in IPv4 and IPv6. So a multicast is when you have one sender and multiple possible receivers, and in IPv6, there's no broadcasts. <laughs> what, there's no broadcasts? How do they do ARP? They don't use ARP. 
<laughs> so in IPv, and we'll have other discussions on IPv6, but IPv, and in IPv6, instead of using any kind of broadcast mechanism, it's if they need to communicate from one device to a bunch of other devices, they use multicast exclusively. And so a multicast address in IPv6 starts with FF at, uh, and two characters below after it regarding the scope and so forth for that multicast. So that's that's the three, that's the, these are two types of addresses that we're gonna expect to see on every interface with IPv6. And we'll also see as we look at the interfaces on our Cisco router or device running multi, uh, IPv6, we're gonna see that they've joined some multicast groups. <laughs> things they're interested in hearing about. And if you see the FF, that's the multicast groups that those devices have joined. Okay, cool. Lots of cool stuff about IPv6. And those are some basics. Here's our topology. I think we can go ahead and just build this. I think I have enough information on the screen. I'm gonna save this screen so I can come back to it if I need to. And let's bring up Packet Tracer. And as you requested, we'll do it from the ground up with nothing currently there. I'm just gonna peek at the screen over on the left for a moment to make sure I can line this up. And I'll also show you the version of Packet Tracer that I am using so that you will know exactly. What version that is if you want to replicate this. Also, I wanna point out that Packet Tracer currently, and I think for the foreseeable future is absolutely free. Just go to netacad.com. It's run and managed by Cisco, the Network Academy, and you can sign up for a free account and you can download Packet Tracer for free. <laughs> and then you can tweak it any way you want to as far as the font sizes and what shows up and what doesn't show up. They've got a great little tutorial right there at Netacad on how to use it. I've also got some videos at CBT Nuggets, which is a paid subscription at CBT, but there's also information there and also on YouTube and everywhere else on how to use it. This, what I've discovered is the more I share with people how to do stuff from scratch here, the more people are doing it, which I'm super happy about that. Hands-on practice is the way to go. And I have been pleasantly surprised several times in the last few months when I did something in Packet Tracer and it didn't behave how I thought it would behave. And I thought, oh, Packet Tracer. <laughs> no, I, I wasn't really upset. I just thought, oh, maybe this Packet Tracer has a problem or an error. And then I went to live gear and I had other people who went to live gear and they said, yeah, same exact thing happens on live gear. It's like, oh, they got it right. So for CCNA, Packet Tracer is a fabulous tool. So let's bring out some routers. And to do that, in the bottom left-hand corner, I'm gonna click on this little network devices icon. And then below it, we have routers and switches, hubs, bad, bad hubs, and then wireless devices and security and so forth. So we'll go ahead and we're gonna bring out some routers. So we'll click on this router icon and let's go for a let's go for a 2911 that'll work and i'm going to bring out three of them and then we'll just rename them and i'm going to make i'm going to make this a little bit bigger so we can see it easily all right and if i have to resize that i will and it's going to call this one router 1 based on our plan and router 2 and router 3 all right, what else do we need? We need some devices, so let's get some. So over here on the bottom left, I'm gonna click on end devices and let's bring up a laptop. I think we had them over here, great. And let's bring up a PC, we had them over here. And a server, we'll put them over here. I'm gonna check my feedback monitor, make sure I can see everything, great. And I'm gonna just rename this server and I'm gonna rename this PC, <laughs> and I'm gonna call this laptop. Because yeah. if I had multiple laptops, I could call them laptop one, two, three, or PC one, two, three. I think that'll do it. And then for our connectivity, let's go ahead and glue these together. Well, before we glue them together, let's check out the modules. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna highlight, I'm gonna select everything. So currently I have the selector tool on up here on the left. I just grabbed it, I'm just gonna drag it all to the left so we can play on the right and have it here on the left and still see everything. Alrighty, and before we start cabling this together, let's check the modules. I'm just clicking on R1. Somebody asked in the previous session, okay, I was using multi-tab putty and I was switching between the tabs really easily. How do you do that in Packet Tracer? And here's what we could do. Let me just check my sizing here. So you could bring up a window for R1. This is the name that I gave it in Packet Tracer. We can change the host name in the config to anything we want within the rules. 
And let me zoom in here a little bit. This is the physical view that we're currently looking at. And let me drag that down a little bit. Great. If you want to turn this off or on, here's a little power switch for it. Funk off. Funk on. Fun stuff. And let's also, okay, so it's got a couple gigabit ports. Let's add a module. It's a modular router, so let's grab a WIC. Uh, this is a, a WIC 2T, which is two serial ports. I'm just going to drag it and drop it over here. Oh, can't do it with the power on. Good. <laughs> not These modules are not hot swappable. So it's telling us that we need to power it off. Thank you. And then I'll drag and drop the WIC 2T module over. Great. And then, uh, you know, I don't like these open bays, so we'll just get a WIC cover right here. Boom. Boom. And that's not just for making it look pretty. It's also for proper ventilation because you don't want to leave those open because then the airflow is going to be not normal if those are just open in the rack. So it'll help with airflow. <laughs> I know it's a simulation. It doesn't care about airflow. It'll still work. And then I'm going to turn it back on. And now it's on. Now I can go to the CLI and now it's booting up. Great. Let's also configure a serial module on R2 because we're going to need it. <clears throat> so we'll click on R2. And that's going to, once you size these up, these are still open in the background. So you can just, from your taskbar, you can just hover over Packet Tracer and just go to the device you want. Or click on the device you want. It'll come right back up in the same format, in the same place. So let me um, power this off. Add a serial module. Boom. And then we'll add the covers just because we can. Great. And then we'll power back on, click, and it is, <clears throat> it's on. All right. So then router three, it's got two, if we hover over this, it's got several gigabit ports, gig 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2. And because I'm not going to do a serial connection there, we don't need any serial ports. So that'll be fine. So let's, let's connect this all together. Uh, to connect it together, we're going to click on this little lightning bolt in the bottom left called connections. And then we get to select our cable type. Woo, fun times. And... If you're not sure what cable type you need, you can use this lightning connector, which if you look down here in the in the bottom, it says automatic. Oh, I, yeah, it shows up. It says automatically choose the connection type. That's fine. No problem there. If you just want basic connectivity, and it'll put the right cable type in. If you want to control the ports and which module and so forth it goes to, you'd want to go ahead and select the right cable. So in the case of gigabit, I'm just going to use the, um, let me show you how to do it manually. So I'm clicking on the lightning bolt tool here. And between R1 and R2, I want to go ahead and use one of these red connections, which is a serial connection. The one with the clock, it says serial DCE, data communications equipment. All it means is that it's going to use a serial port that's providing clocking. And the DTE is a data terminal equipment. That's a device that's receiving clocking. But check this out. <laughs> if we click on that, just the serial DTE, and I go to R1, and then I choose the port. Uh, which port do I want to use? Let's use serial 000. And then I drag it down here to R2. And let's use serial 001. You notice what it did there? Look at that. See that little picture of a clock? <laughs> it automatically treats that as the end that's providing clocking. They want it to work for you. Now, in a, in a physical environment, what you'd have to do is do a clock rate command on that interface to provide the clocking. But I think in Packet Tracer, they're thinking, you know what, we just want this to work for you. We don't want to have you force you to do clocking or have that link not come up. So that's what that symbol there means. All right, so we've got our serial connection, which is probably T, uh, serial 1.54 megabits per second is probably what the bandwidth's going to be. We can take a look at it. Now let's, let's connect the rest of the network together. And I want to control the ports here. So let's go ahead and use this cable right here. It's a straight, mm. These are two like devices, two 2911s. So I'm going to use this option here, the dotted line, the crossover. And I'm going to go from the 2911 gig 0 slash 1, R2, over to R3. And let's use gig 0 slash 2. So if I had used the auto tool, it would have automatically chosen a crossover cable because we're going from two like devices, two routers. Same thing would happen with two PCs and so forth. So there we go. That's done. 
And now let's go to R3 and its connection high speed gigabit between R3 and R1. So this is R1 here at the top. You can move these around too if you need to, you know, if the labels are hidden a little bit. You can also control under options and preference, you can control what's shown and what's not shown. I like to see the ports. I like to see the link indicators because they're very handy when something doesn't go right or you're just learning. They're handy to see and remember. So let's go ahead and connect R3 up to R1. And to do that, let's use gig01 on both sides. So to do that, we'll just click on this connector tool. We'll click on the crossover cable and we'll go gig01 here to gig01 there. And so it's the other kind of bunched up. We can control the zooming, you can control the labels, but I just wanna make sure that we know that together we have serial 000 from R1 going down to serial I'm going to write this down. <laughs> Serial 001 on R2. And again, we could drag these around if we need to see those ports a little better and so forth. But I have this zoomed in quite a bit because I want to see in the demo. Let's see here. <laughs> All right. I could spend an hour trying to get this perfect, but uh, I'm going to leave these as is and say we know what ports are in use. Okay. Now let's connect our clients. So with our clients, if we want to connect them to these routers, we don't have to put switches in. We can just use crossover cables or we can use the auto connect tool. Either way works great. So from the server, from its fast ethernet, let's go to gig zero zero. And I'm going to use gig zero zero on all the routers to their clients. And that way I, I can remember what ports go where. And then R2, same thing from gig zero zero to the PC. And from the router three crossover cable to the laptop. Okay, great. So now the question is, Keith, uh, I see a lot of red here. Well, <laughs> yeah. What's the default attitude for a port on a router? Down, newbie, do down, down. I'm staying down <clears throat> until you bring me up. So the reason we have all these LED indicators, link indicators that are red because all the interfaces are shut down by default. So we need to bring them up. And I'm going to do a little bit of documentation to make sure that as I'm working with this, I can... Even though we have it on screen, I want to make sure that I get the right ports. So from R1 here at the top, you can also add labels too and everything else in package tracer. So for right here, R1 serial 000 goes down to R2. And on R2, it's serial 001 goes up to R1. And on R3, it's gig 0 slash 2 that goes over to gig 0 slash 1. And on R3 to R to R1, it's gig zero slash one going up to gigs. Mm, let me just move that for a second. Yeah, gig zero slash one. Great. And then I've got gig zero zero on each interface going out to the clients. All right. So thanks for joining me for the live stream. Catch you. <laughs> now, now we need to actually configure it to make it actually work. Um, I'm just thinking, is there anything else I need to do while I'm here? I think that's I think that's it. Let's go ahead and start. Oh, yeah, let's start configuring. So let's start on R1. And I'm going to make sure I can that is in the window. So we can size these windows to the appropriate width and then just come back to them. And they'll be in the same place. So if we bring up R2, go to CLI, and I'm going to scooch this guy over a little bit right, right there. And then we go to R3 and make him also, him or her, about the same. Then we can, from my taskbar, I'm just grabbing R1 or R1 there, R2. And that way you can very easily switch back and forth between these devices without having to reopen them. Because once you close this, I think you have to resize it every time the way you want. So let's start with R1. And do we want to enter the initial configuration? The answer I'm going to say is no. But thank you for asking. And, and I think we should bring up Notepad. <laughs> because there are definitely some things that we want to do on each of these devices consistently, and I don't want to have to manually type it all in. So if we were doing network automation, once we had all these under the control of a controller, we could actually push all these configs out, but because we're just doing it manually, we're going to go into, con let's do this. No password by default, so that'll put us into config uh, privilege mode. Config T, line console zero, Logging synchronous, no exec, t 
timeout. And let's do a no IP domain dash lookup. That's the current way of doing it. Now, if you did domain space lookup, it would still take. And what else do we want to do? No IP domain lookup, no exec timeout, locking synchronous. We'll save it. That's a shortcut for copy run start, just so it's there in the config. And let's just do this on all three routers. So I'm going to highlight those, copy them. <laughs> I'm going to test on one, see if it barks. Paste. There we go. That worked. And R2, I'll say no to this because it's not expected. I'm, I'm going to be at the wrong place to start. There we go. Paste. Awesome. And R3. And paste. All right, great. So I've got some of my basic pet peeves out of the way. So it's going to repaint the lines with logging synchronous. It's not going to time me out of the console for it, which is great. And it's not going to go for looking up a typo, uh, trying to resolve it to a DNS server if I put something in wrong in the command line. All right, those are all sound, those are all great starts. Uh, we also want to rename these. So let's start at R1, and let's just do some basic configs at R1. So configuration mode, host name, R1. All right, and also at the very top, that's where it shows you the actual router number you're on. That matches your packet tracer lab. So having the host name and the packet tracer name match, convenient to make sure you're on the right device. And let's configure the interfaces. So let's go to, let's do this, this interface first, gig zero, zero. So I want to say this one, this interface is leading off to the server. So interface gig zero slash zero, no shutdown, IPv6 address. And for that interface, it's going to be 2001. See that period? That is like a force of habit from decades of IPv4. So 2001 colon DB8 colon 6783 colon that is going to be network one because it's off of router one, colon, colon, one. So the colon, colon represents that, hey, there's a whole, there's one or more sections of zeros right here. Mr. Router, you figure it out. And so it says, well, there should be eight. And it sees one, two, three, four, five sections. So it knows there's three groupings of zeros that it will automatically insert to save us time. And that is a 64-bit network, meaning the first 64 bits are the network. The mask is 64 bits on. And then the last 64 bits are host addressing. Great. And let's also let's also specify the link local address. So if we do a do show IPv6 interface right now, check this out. Here's the IPv6 address that we configured right there in all of its glory. And it also gave it this link local address automatically. And it did that with the thing called EUI64, where it took the MAC address and it inserted FFFE -F 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 -E -F -F -E in the middle. Anyway, if we want to control that, we can. And just on, on this router, I'd like to, let's do a IPv6 address. And we'll force our own link local address just because we can on this device. And we'll use FF, that's a multicast address, FE80 colon colon one. And then we're going to follow it with this keyword called link local, meaning, hey, it should know, right? I mean, if it starts with FE anything, it should, FE80, it should know, hey, this is a link local address, but you have to add the keyword link local, and now it knows. So if we do a show IPv6 interface, now here we have our globally routable address of this bad, of this bad boy right here, which is on this network following it, and it has a link local address of FE80 colon colon one. And that colon colon back to back represents six groupings of zeros that we didn't have to manually type in. Also, you'll notice that this computer has joined some multicast groups. So FF02 is the multicast, well, that's another story, but it's joined a couple of multicast, multicast groups, one for a multicast listener discovery, and again, we can talk about that in another video. But <clears throat> there's an example of three different address types, global, link local, and multicast that it's all using at this moment on that interface. And the interface is up. So we must have done a no shut, although I forgot doing that. But we did, <laughs> looking back, I was like, yeah, Keith, this is one of the first things he did. Okay, let's do the other two interfaces. And these will go a little bit faster. Let's go to uh, serial 000, which is the interface that goes down to R2. And let me verify, let's do a do show CD. So here's the trick can't really do a show CDP neighbors yet because the interfaces are down. 
So if I wanted to really verify that's the connecting link, I would need to go to R1, go to R2, do a no shut, wait for a few seconds, maybe up to 60 seconds, and then actually take a look and show CDP neighbors to verify that those are directly connected. But in this case, it's the only interface I'm using up here, serial 000, so I believe it is the one that's connected down to R2. And we'll do a no shut. Actually, we have our choice here. For serial connections, we have options of HDLC, which is the default, which is a proprietary layer, layer two encapsulation that Cisco implements on serial links, or we could do with point to point protocol. Let's do point to point. We'll do encapsulation, PPP. And actually I'll show you a question mark here. So <laughs> not frame relay, that was like two decades ago. So we'll do PPP and we'll do that on the other side as well. And then we'll also do a no shut. You'll notice with the no shut, it didn't go to green yet here. And that's because the other side that we are directly connected to is not up. So it's gonna stay down. Uh, it's not administratively down, but it's the, the layer two part is down until we get the other side up with the right encapsulation as well. And IPv6, actually I just hit the up arrow key a few times. IPv6 address 2001DB86783. This is gonna be between R1 and R2, so it's 12. And the host address is one. And I'm not gonna bother doing the link local addresses on all the links between the routers. They can figure out each other's addresses easily. They do that with IPv6, so I don't need to hard code it. And let's also do this interface, which is gig zero slash one between R1 and R3. So we'll go to in interface configuration mode for gig, I hope it's zero slash one. We'll find out soon enough. Gig zero slash one and hit the up arrow key a few times and we'll give this the IP address of 2001db86783. This is gonna be 13 between the two router numbers and its last octet, last IP address, the last portion of its IPv6 address, it's really not an octet because there's 16 bits in that last chunk, is one and then we'll also bring it up with a no shutdown. Now, because this guy is back to back between R1 and R3, that's also why this LED indicator is not going green yet because the other side, there's no connectivity. <laughs> so as soon as we get R2 and R3 up and running, it'll be a lot happier. So let's verify our work. We'll do a show IPv6 inter interface brief. Ah, good. The brief option works, fantastic. So there's gig zero zero, which is going off to our, our server and it is network one, great. And then we have gig zero one, which is going down to R3. That's the 13 network, that's great. And then we have serial zero, 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 which is going down to R2. That's the 12 network. All that looks great, including the automatically assigned link local addresses for those other two interfaces. So I think we're good here. I'll just save that and let's go to R2. So it's just clicking on R2, it brings up the window as I left it. So it's able to be seen in same position. And let's do some magic here, config T and hostname R2. <laughs> okay, and we've got some interfaces to configure. Let's go to interface gig zero slash zero. That's going off to the left to that PC over there. And we'll do an IPv6 address and it's gonna be 2001db8 6783 colon three, uh, this is R2, so this is gonna be network two. And then when the last host address portion will be dot is two, and then we'll go ahead and say that's a 64 bit network. And let's also do an IPv6 address FE80 colon colon two, just for grins and link local. That's just for that link out to that client. Now there's auto configuration too that can be used on all these devices for the clients and so forth, but I'm just gonna hard code it for this. That way, if you're following along, you can know exactly the addresses that are gonna be in use on those network interfaces that connect to the clients, the server, the client, and the PC. The server, the laptop, and the PC. In this case, it's the PC hanging off of R2. And let's go ahead and configure the serial interface, which is serial 001, so interface, Oh, did I bring that up? I need to bring that interface up too. No shutdown. That helps. And if we if we scroll over here a little bit, all right. See how that link in now it's green because it's connected to the PC and we brought the link up and the PC's on, so we are in good shape. Great. All right. Next, let's configure the other two interfaces, and that would include serial zero zero one. 
using the old pen trick, point to the router you're configuring. So interface serial 0 slash 0 slash 1, encapsulation PPP has to match on both sides, otherwise they will not be happy between R1 and R2. And IPv6 address 2001 db. Oh, I can hit the up arrow key a few times, save myself some typing. So it's going to be 6783, and that network between R2 and R1 is the 12 network. Our last portion of our IPv6 address is 2. That looks good. No shutdown. Yeah, and the links came up right here. So that's a very good indicator. And then we'll do the interface gig 0 slash 1. We'll bring it up. Give it an IPv6 address. This is network 23. So when there's two routers connected to each other, I use the lower router number first than the higher. That way, it, so between R2 and R3, it's going to be network 23. And that looks good. Let's do a do show IPv6 interface brief. And just verify that we have, yeah. I didn't, and verify that our interfaces are up and have the right addresses. So gig00 has the network ending in 2. That's great. Gig 0 slash 1 has the network ending in 23. That's between R2 and R3 on this interface. And serial 001 has the network of 12, which is between R1 and R2, with the last number of the IPv6 address being a 2. So now, if we did a, let me save this. Now if we do a show IPv CDP neighbor, I'm surprised I don't see uh, R1. Show CDP. Oh, okay. Oh, the interface just came to up. Okay, all right. I'm not sure what took you so long. Oh, maybe I did. Well, you know what? Let's troubleshoot this. So I did a show CDP just to verify CDP is running, and it is. And now I see that the interface serial 001 just came up. So let's do a show CDP neighbor again. There he is. That was a long time to come up. <laughs> That's okay though, it's up. And I didn't add clocking either. I didn't add clocking, so I guess that's not required with Packet Tracer, but it's up. All right, so let's continue our configuration. Let me just double check where I was. We'll do a show, we'll do a show IPv6 interface brief. All right, I've got three interfaces that are up and they're all configured. Let's go configure R3. So here on R3, we've got three interfaces. Gig00 goes out to this laptop. 01 goes up to R1, and 02 goes over to R2. So we'll go to work. Host name, R3. And interface gig00, we'll start there first. IPv6 address is going to be 2001, DB8, 6783. And that network hanging off of R3 on gig00 is the three network based on the router ID or the router number, colon, colon. And the host portion is going to be three slash 64. And for good measure, we'll also do IPv6 address. And we'll do FE80, colon, colon, three. We, we, we could use the same one over and over again, but just for organizational purposes, Every link has to have unique link local addresses. And so there's a thing called duplicate address detection that happens. But I'm going to just do FE80 colon colon the router number on these gig00 interfaces as a face clients. And we'll say link local. Great. And a no shutdown because that's also really important. OK. And I saw the link, link indicator go green. Super. All right. Here we go. One down, two to go. So we'll go to interface gig0 slash 1. This is the interface going up to R1. Hit the upper, upper arrow key a few times, and that's going to be the 13 network between R1 and R3. And we'll do a no shutdown. And that link just turned green. That's great. And then we'll go to interface gig 0 slash 2. Not dot 2. It felt good, but it wasn't good. Interface gig 0, 2. This is the interface that goes over to R. This is R3's connection over to R2. Hit the upper arrow key a few times, and that would be network 23 and a no shutdown. And that link comes up. Well, that's that's Andy. So let's do a quick check. Show IPv6 interface brief. 
great. Its three interfaces are up. They're configured with, just looking at the, the network. So looks like we have the correct, and then we could verify uh, pinging to those neighbors. So R3 should be able to ping R2 at its directly connected address. We don't have routing in place, so we can't ping any further than the local neighbor until we get some static routes going on. So let's do a quick ping to, I'm cheating. I'm going to R2. And here on R2, this address right here is this. I'm just going to copy it. So I'm going to copy R2's address, which is on the 23 network with the last portion being a 2, going back to R3 and just doing a ping and pasting that address. And we got 5 out of 5. That's great. Hey, Keith, how come it doesn't time out on that first ping like many IPv4 routers do? Probably because it's not using ARP. <laughs> You're not having, there's the neighbor discovery protocol, which is going through some motions behind the scenes, but it's not ARP. And so there's, that issue doesn't exist with IPv6 about losing that first ping packet because it isn't being consumed by ARP. All right, so uh, I think I saved everything. Let me save it again. I'm also gonna go to this project and say file, save as, and let's call it uh, 315. 315 live. All right, so we can go back to that point if we need to. And routing. Let's <laughs> now we can do routing. Like, wow, okay, that was like 50 minutes of uh, base configuration for IPv6. Good stuff. Now, in setting up routing, this is very much fair game for CCNA, by the way. Not to have you build the whole thing from scratch, which I think if you do, it's going to be good, a good experience for you. But I think the fair game would be to say, now, based on this topology, what static routes would make this topology work using the optimal paths? And they might ask you to, I, and I haven't seen the exam yet. It's, it's the uh, 15th of March. I'm going to be taking that exam before Cisco Live, but I haven't taken it yet. But based on the blueprint and the requirements for static routing for IPv6, I think a fair game question could be what routes would be appropriate from a pick list to implement on each respective router to make this work. So, before we start, you know, pumping in static routes for IPv6, we got to probably take a look at this logically, see what needs to be done, what could be done, and then we'll implement some and then we'll go ahead and test it. So let's go back to our desktop here. I've saved this work. Let's go back to our drawing board and let's talk about static routes. <clears throat> yeah, I think this all pans out just like we <laughs> just like we planned. Let me actually get out uh, another layer. So if I need to erase this, I can. And by the way, it's so great to have everybody here. Also, I will be doing some other videos on IPv6. So if you need a, a more of an education on IPv6, stick around. We'll be doing some additional ones. Also at CBT Nuggets about five years ago, six years ago, they asked me to make an IPv6 course and I went a little crazy. I mean, it's, it's long. And I just went into all these details and this and that and the other and routing protocols with IPv6. So if you're a member at CBT Nuggets or if you want to do a trial there and just check out those videos, uh, there's a seven-day free tri trials available. There's a, a plethora of data. Also, in the new CCNA course, we have Jeremy covers IPv6, and also I cover IPv6 static routing there in great detail as well. So those are all, all great resources if you want to peek at those as well. Okay, so for routing, let's imagine from these routers perspectives, what they need to reach. So from router one, it needs to reach the three network. When I say three, 2001, DB8, 6783, three. And from router one, it needs to be able to reach 2001, DB8, 6783, two. Because those are two networks that are not directly connected where we have remote networks we might need to forward packets to. So if the server, wants to reach the PC or the PC wants to reach the server, R1 needs to know how to route to those networks. What I'm not too concerned about is R1 being able to reach the 23 subnet or the 23 network because there's no devices there. It's really just a communication path for R2 and R3. So I'm not going to go crazy overboard and say, oh, we need reachability to every possible subnet or network rather because these are all just networks at this point. We haven't started subnetting past 64. But uh, just to the actual network. So, so router one needs access. Let me bring up a different pen that is temporary. Give me one moment. And there's a temporary pen. Great. So R1 needs access to 
network two and three. R2 needs routes, I should say, to get to one and three. And R3 needs to learn routes to get to one and two. And so when we create static routes, it's basically instruction sets on, okay, dear Mr. Router one, if you need to reach network two down here, who's your next hop? That's effectively what we need to do. So it goes something like this, IPv6, if we're on R1 and global config, IPv6, route. And one of the hardest things is typing v6 every time. <laughs> so, because I, for me anyway, show IP or IP route is just so ingrained that I, I almost have to force myself to remember to put in the IPv6 to look at just the IPv6. A totally separate protocol. IPv6 on its own world, separate completely than IPv4. So, IPv6 route space the network you want to get to. So, if we're talking about the two network, it would be 2001. DB8, 67832. That's the network. So we that's the syntax actually. IPv6 route. If you need to get to this network, then with a space, what's the next hop gonna be? And that's my question for you. What's the next hop gonna be? If R1 needs to forward a packet, so the server says, I need to ping this PC at 2001 DB8 6783 2 colon colon 10. We haven't configured this PC yet, but assume we did. That you know, he forwards the packet to its default gateway. We'd also need to configure that or auto config it. What would R1 do? Should R1 go down this way, path A, or down this way, path B? Because that's going to make a big difference on what we put for the next hop here from R1's perspective. So I, again, this is fair game for CCNA. Like which, which is the optimal route? Is it going to go R2 is the next hop or R3 is the next hop? If we're looking for optimal route, the fastest route. And I'm going to peek at the queue for a second. And what I'd like you to do is, if you would, I'd like your opinion. Who should R1 use as the next hop? Should it be R1 or R2? I'm sorry. R1 is itself. That'd be sad. That'd be uh, not R2 or R3. Who should be the next hop? Oh, right. <laughs> And I see a, an assortment of answers, including D2, like R2D2. I love it. Mm. And I, I see a lot of R3s coming in too. So I think either way would work, right? Functionality, R1 could use R2 as the next hop or R3 as the next hop. But if the word optimal was in the question, or if you and I were designing this network and we had to use static routes, the next path should be R3, the next hop, because this link right here, I'll put a big sad face. It's so freaking slow. It's T1, 1.54 serial slow, slow. This is gigabit, orders of magnitude faster and has more capacity bandwidth wise than a serial link. So ideally, if we're looking at the optimal path, it's not a straight line. I know it's like the, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Not if you have gigabit on path B. <laughs> and so the next hop, if we're doing it optimally, would be R3, which would be R3's address of 2001, DB8, 6783. This is the 13 network colon, colon, three, which would be R3's address. And then R3, when he receives that packet destined for the two network, he would look in its routing table and based on how we statically configured R2, R2, uh, then based on how we statically configured R3 for routing to the two network, it would then make a routing decision and it would forward it this way. So ideally, the server reaching this PC, it would go down path B, routing decision would be made here as well, and then R2 would make a routing decision and forward it off to its local client if we're going to do it optimally. So those are some things to be aware of and watch out for. And, and we'd have to have all these routes in place to make it work. Now, a second aspect of this is what if this route goes away? And we're not going to have time today in this live stream to do it. But if this link went away and R1 has a static route that says, hey, to get to the two network, go this way. And then this link is gone. He like shut down or cut. 
and he no longer has that interface, that static route using this next hop right here is no bueno, no good, because he can't get to that next hop. So then what do we do? And if you're thinking, well, Keith, I don't know, tell us. Well, let me tell you. We could put in a floating static route with a higher administrative distance. This is, hey, Mr. R1, this route right here has a default administrative distance of, with a static route with the next hop address is usually a default administrative distance of one. We'll verify that here in the lab in a minute. Um, but if we wanted to create a second static route that was in the wings, we could make a second static route saying, hey, for that specific network, the two network, your next hop is R2, this address over this link right here, and give it an administrative distance of like five. With an AD of five, that route won't show up in the routing table if the primary route is already present because AD wins. That's how you get in the routing table. If you, if you want to brush up on that, check out our video called Why Routes Have to Win Twice. The first time is getting into the routing table and the second time is being selected from the routing table. And so if we had an AD of five for the same exact network of 2001 db 867832 and had an AD of five, this one with an AD of one would win, be in the routing table. And if that link went down, which means that route, the primary route would no longer be there, this AD of five, that route is the winner. And it would go into the routing table and then R1 could start using that path instead by using a floating static route. To do all of that with static routes in this live stream would be more than more than what you asked for. But I just want to give you a tease that that's how we could do it. Another option would be come see me in CCNP in Encore and we'll take a look at doing OSPF version three for IPv6, which once you configure it, they all have the same link state database. They all have the LSAs. They all know everything about the network and it automatically converges in about five seconds. <laughs> and that's why we use dynamic routing protocols. But um, the case in point, this is a good exercise for logic in setting up routing. So let's implement a functional network. We'll leave off the, the uh, floating static routes for another discussion another day. But I just want to point out that they're available as a backup if you need it. And let's just do our static routes. So from R1's perspective, to get to the two network, the best path is going to be R3. From uh, R1's perspective, to get to the network of three, it's going to be R3. <laughs> From R2's perspective, it's, it needs to get to uh, network one. The best path is going to be through R3 also because of this slow serial link. Think of this slow serial link as the worst path and the backup if needed, if you have routing to support it. And for R2 to get to the three network, it's going to go straight across. And for R3 to get to network one, it's going to go up the Ethernet uh, gigabit link. And for R3 to get to R2's local network, it's going to go, go across the Ethernet link. So now we need to implement that. And it is going to take a little bit of thinking, but we can do it. We can do it together. And we'll use, note, we'll use Notepad. Let's do it in Notepad with the topology, and then we can go ahead and implement it. And let's we'll use this topology right here. I'll just bring up a copy of Notepad. Let me get rid of my, I'm going to leave that scratch on there, and we'll open up. Notepad. Notepad. Also, oh, okay, I'm going to erase that because I don't want it on top of there. Boom. So if you're just joining us for these live streams, this is this is not the first live stream for some of these brand new networking. <laughs> this is a, a live stream that you can enjoy more and get more out of after you've been through some of the previous live streams. where We've taken a look at reading a routing table, including IPv4 and static routes and how it works. And so if you're just joining us, please feel free to subscribe and get alerts. That way you know when new videos come out. And there's a master playlist on my YouTube channel that is called the CCNA Master Playlist for 200-301. And I put them in order, mostly in order for what I think logically would come next and next and next. And I'm just adding the live streams to that. So that's a great place to start as well. All right, let me change the view on this, the format, the font. And also, I see a lot of people who are helping other people in the chats, which I really appreciate. That's great. Let me get an 18 point. All right. So on R1, let me scooch this over a little more, so make sure we can still see it. Oh, these are IPv6 addresses. They're going to be huge. I am going to get rid of my face. Bye. Bye, face. And we'll move this around as we need so we can see the whole thing. Config D. <laughs> And this is going to be on router one. So on, on router one, we are going to say IPv6 
route to get to 2001 DB8 6783 colon 2. That's the 2 network hanging off of R2. Colon colon with a slash 64. That's how you specify it. And I will bring this over here so we can read it. There you go. So IPv6 are out to get to the 2 network. The next hop is going to be, and I'm going to copy paste this. Who am I kidding? Control. <laughs> control C, Control V. The next hop is going to be 2001 DB8 6783. It's going to be R2, which is at 12. That's the network between R1 and R2, colon, colon, 2. Boom. And we'll take the default administrative distance. So that is the route we'd need to get to the 2 network. And let's add one for the 3 network. Control, Control. I'm just copying that. I'm going to edit it. So to get to the 3 network, our next hop would be R3, which is on the 23 network. And the next hop would be the last address of 3. I'm just going to look at my work and make sure that's right. So to get to the 2 network, the next hop is 12.2, which is R2. Oh, oh wait, I just said that that's not the optimal path. Stop the truck, Keith. Let's take the optimal path. Let's do it. So to get to the 2 network, we actually want to go to R3, which is 23.3. And that way, we're using the gigabit path through the network. Absolutely. And oh, you know what else we need to do? <laughs> That's really important. <laughs> So IPv6 unicast routing says, I'm willing to route packets, says the router, on behalf of other people, not just my own IPv6 traffic. And so whether that's enabled or not by default in this flavor of packet tracer, I don't know, but that will enable it. And if it's not there, it will cause us a problem. So that just saves us that grief. All right, so that's, I just look at the logic here. So from R1 to get to the two network, it's gonna go to R3. And to get to the three network, it's gonna go to R3. Fantastic. So from R1's perspective, he's solid. Let's take a look at configuring R2. So I'm going to copy this whole thing. Control C, Control V, rename it R2. I'm also going to add an end here, just make it nice and pretty. And on R2, I'm going to scroll a little bit so I can keep everything in, in frame. Okay, so R2, to get to the one network, this is why drawing it out too ahead of time gives you a chance to think and plan and know where the IP addresses are. So to get to the one network, we want to go through R3, which is 23.3. No, it's not. Oh, crap. Holy schnikers. I, I, this would not have worked. Look at this. So for R1, its next hop is R3, but it's on the 13 network. You can't use a next hop that you can't reach unless you have a routing protocol that's teaching how to reach that remote network, and that's called a re recursive lookup. But we've got no dynamic routing protocols. So uh, again, I need to double check this real quick. So from R1's perspective, to get to the two network, 13.3 across this link on the right-hand side of our screen is going to be used. Perfect. And also to get to the three network, we're also going to use 13.3. Oh, that's probably why the chats were blown up. Keith, you got the wrong next stop. Um, it would have panned out in the interface. And thank you very much for that feedback, by the way. Okay, for R2, for it to get to the one network, it's going to use 23.3, which is R3. And for it to get to the three network, it's going to use 23.3 across the gigabit path. That looks good. And if it doesn't, <laughs> if it doesn't look good, we'll, uh, we'll sort that out as well. And then, our, then R3, I go ahead and copy R2 and paste and rename this bottom one R3. For it to get to the one network, from R3's perspective, the next hop is going to be 13.1, which is this network, this green network over here on the on the right. Yep. <laughs> and then for it to get to the 2 network, it's going to send it over to R2 over the 23 network with colon 2 being the next hop. All right, so here's what I would love to do. Looking at these three configs, I'm interested, and I will look at them one more time. <laughs> but I'm interested to see if there's any mistakes here that you notice before I put them in. So I'm going to look at these one more time. 
So to get to the two network, I'm going to go 13.3. To get to the three network, R1 looks good to me. R2. To get to the one network, it's going to go to its neighbor 23.3. And else for the, that looks good. And for R3, for it to get to the one network, it's going to go 13.1 up to R1. And for it to get to the two network, it's going to go 23.2. These look good to me. If you have any feedback that, like, oh, this looks wrong or that's not quite right, let me know. And I've got a question real quick asking, <clears throat> what is the 13 colon colon 3? The colon colon back to back simply means there's a bunch of zeros in there that I don't have to physically type out 0 colon 0 colon 0 colon. So it knows there should be eight groupings of IP addresses in the complete address. And so anywhere it has a colon colon, which is a trick you can use once per IP address, it realizes, oh, you've got one, two, three, four, five groupings specified. That means there must be three sets of zeros, three groups of zeros represented by the colon colon. I think these look great. I do. Let's go ahead and implement them and see if we have routing across the network. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad we did. And, and the, the additional layer would be backup routes, floating static routes for if the primary links fail and routing everybody another way. So let's implement it. Let's go back to Packet Tracer, wherever that is. Here we go. And let's go to R1. Let me bring up Notepad. And uh, did I save it? Hold on one second. Let me see here. Boom. I have, I have a few notepads open, so I'm going to close those. <laughs> uh, do, 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 do. Is this the one we just did? I hope it is. 13, 3, 13. Ah, it looks good. All right. Yeah. All right. So let's take this one on R1. Let's copy. Go to R1. Right click. Paste. And done. Then we'll bring up Notepad again. Go to R2. We've already done the thinking. Now it's just a time to apply it. And we'll go to R2 over here. Click on it. Right click, paste. So far, so good. <laughs> and then we'll go to R3. Go back to our Notepad document and grab R3's config. Copy and paste. All right, I think we're in good shape. Let's let's verify. Let's let's do some testing from the routers, and then we can actually do testing from our PCs if we want to as well. So if we go to R1, and here on R1, if we do a show IPv6 route, and let's see if it'll take static. Mm, it doesn't like oh, it doesn't like that. So it it's okay. Uh, if we did a show IPv6 route static, it just shows the static routes, but it doesn't like that in Packet Tracer, so that's okay. We can just do a show IPv6 route, and that's okay too. And as far as getting to the two network, let's go ahead and let's do a trace to two. So I'm going to copy that, and we'll do a ping. Let's do a trace. We'll do a trace route to that address, that network, and on that we have the host of two. So this is the, the gig zero zero interface of R2. That is not flying. That is not flying. <laughs> that is not working. Hold on, I'm gonna do the control shift six, which should break this, meaning should stop the sequence. Ah, oh, this is what a good simulator. Control shift six. Because sometimes when you do control shift six, it won't break out either. Oh, come on, buddy. We're doing a live demo here. Control shift six. All right, while it considers life, let's go back to my text document and let's look at it real quick. IPv6 unicast routing. Yeah. 
So what this means is trace, it says to 2001 DB8 2 colon colon two, which is the IP address over here off of R2. Its first hop was 13.3, which is perfect. And let's go check out R3, make sure R3 can get there. I'm gonna use that same command. Copy, go to R3. And can you, oh, oh I, I guess I didn't copy it. Trace to 2003, 2001 DB8 6783 colon 2 colon 2. Oh, and he can get there. So R3 knows how to get to that address. Hmm. I'm curious. And I'm curious how this long, <laughs> I'm curious how long this is going to take. I'm going to close that window and let's bring it back. Oh my gosh, not good. Control shift six is the break sequence that should be breaking us out of that. Maybe it has a maximum timeout, it'll stop. All right, so, and we're at the console of this thing too. Hmm. Well, let's do this. Let's go down to R2 and let's check its routes out and we'll come back and we'll check out R1 in a minute. Show, show IPv6 route. All right, let's test the network of three. So this static route here on R2 says that to get to 2001DB86783, which is hanging off of R3, the next top is 2001DB86783, 23 colon three. And let's do a ping to that. First, I'm going to verify I can just talk to my neighbor. That's not a bad idea. So R2 can ping R3. Let's ping 3 colon colon 3. Okay, so this static route is working from R2 to the local interface, that gig 0 interface in R3. Let's also, let's see if I can ping R1. <laughs> so 2001 DB8 6783. One colon colon one is the inside interface of of gig zero zero on R one. And that is not flying. Why is that? Let me take that same command and let's go <laughs> Oh, let's go to R three and let's see if I can ping that. Oh, this is not right. Does R three not have I Routing enabled? It does, I think. Show, run, pipe, include, IPv6. IPv6 unicast routing. What it feels like, it feels like IPv6 unicast routing isn't enabled because R3 can ping that loop back on R1 and it can ping R2 and vice versa, but R2 can't route through R3, so IPv6 unicast routing. It feels like that's not on, but it's it's on. It was in the config. Let's go to R2. I'm going to make sure it's on everywhere. And let's go to R1. Oh, good. Timed out after 30. Thank goodness. Oh, come on, Keith. All right. Show IPv6 route. All right, let's focus on three for a moment. So 2001 DB86783, that network is the one hanging off of R3. And I just want to verify that it really is. So here on R3, show IPv6, interface brief. There it is in all of its glory. I'm going to copy that. So from R1's perspective, that is not a local route, but we do have a static route to it. So we'll do a ping, paste, and it works. <laughs> so what isn't working though is what's not working is going to two colon colon two. And before I ping that, I want to verify that that really is the address here off R2. So on R2, show IPv6 interface brief. That's the address. Oh crap, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> right click. Copy, 
So can our three ping that? Yes. Can our one ping that? No. Oh my gosh. So what this means is that R3 is not willing to route that traffic to 2001 DB8 67832, that network. Let's do a show IPv6. Let's do a sh on, because the trace route shows the first path as hitting R2. Let's go to R2. Oh, sorry, R3, the one on the far right. Show IPv6 route. So this says that. This says right here that to get to 2001db867832, which is this network hanging on to the left of R2, uh, the next hop is 2001db867823 colon colon 2. And we can ping that address. Copy. Ping. But why are we not routing for it? Okay, that's not going to help us. Um, hmm. It feels it feels like IPv6 unicast routing is not enabled on this router, and that's what it, that's what it feels like. Let's do a quick show again. Show, run, include IPv6. IPv6 unicast routing is on, and there's our routes. There's our addresses. Let me turn it off and back on again. Let's go back to router one. 2001 DBA 6732 colon colon two. And that route. And that route says use 2001 DBA 13.colon colon three, which is R3. Huh. <laughs> well, by George, that is not flying. I don't know why that's not flying. Hmm. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take a look at the queue and see if you guys say, Kate, there's something amazing that you're not seeing. I would love to see that, like right now. Did you turn it off and on again? Thank you, Rodri. I did. Turn it off. I, it feels it feels like IPv6 unicast routing is not enabled. That's the exact behavior where the router, it can reach both sides, but it won't route packets for other devices. Um, show IP protocol would show us our routing pro well. We're not running any dynamic routing protocols. So that's going to be a, a no-show. <laughs> Let's see here. Yeah, I, I, I looked at the debugs. Good good question. I looked at the debugs, and there's no debug for... There's a debug for OSBF, which we're not running. Let's see here. From R1, it should be 13 colon 2. So the colon colon 2... So we're taking the optimal path. We're going across the fast path as opposed to the other path. You know what I'm willing to do? No, there's so great, great comments. Is it split horizon? Uh, uh, I'm not even using the serial link. That's why it should. So R2 to R3 should be 23 colon colon three. Let me take a look. Let me bring you back here. R2 to R3 should be 23 colon colon three. That's that's definitely true. Show IPv6 route. Yep, so here's the route back to the one network. Oh. I'm so sad. <laughs> I'll tell you why. I think I did this to myself. Let me share with you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Welcome to the world of IT. So, 
here, here's what I think is a possibility. And then together, we can analyze whether or not that is the case. Let me clear the screen and bring up a pen. If this router right here, let me go ahead and um, bring up my pen. There we go. So if this router generates traffic, oh my gosh, this is exactly what's happening. So we checked all the routes. Great exercise in checking routes, right? Oh, he knows how to get there. He knows how to get there. IPv6 routing is enabled. All the classics that usually stop people from being able to get routed traffic for IPv6. But if this device right here does a ping or a trace, so it goes down here, and then it's routed here, the response needs to come back from R2. Makes sense. However, however, what's the source address? What's happening is he's sourcing it from this freaking interface. Gigs, not free. It's not their fault. I did this. This router, router one, is sourcing that packet from gig zero slash one. Let's take a look at that address. It's 2001 DB8 6783 colon. This is the 13 network colon colon slash 64. So its address would be 13 colon uh, colon one here. So when this packet hits, and R3 knows how to reach it because it's a local network, directly connected, don't need a route. But when R2 sees it, it sees the source address as coming from 2001 DB8 678313. Guess what it says? We don't have to ask. We don't have to look too far. Check this, <laughs> check this out. How embarrassing. I mean, it's great. I mean, this is the type of stuff you learn from labbing. And the fact that I did this on the fly today with our topology, um, it happens. So let's go back to our... Let's go back to R2, and let's let's look at the routing table for IPv6, and see anywhere in there if you see where there's a route to the 13 network. Just take a gander. It's not in there, and that's because this device, this router, doesn't have a route to the 13 network, and so it got that packet and said, "I don't know how to route this," and it dropped it. That was the problem. If we had sourced the packet from the 10.6, uh, 10, from the 2001 DB8 one network, which this guy has a route for right here, we'd be in great shape. <laughs> so there's two ways of doing that. In a real router, you could source it from the appropriate interface, <clears throat> or you could go ahead and actually source it from a client on that network. Let's just do that. That'd be the easiest. This is the server sitting up on the 2001 DB8 one network and let's configure him with an IP address. So we'll go to config interface. I would I would do the auto config, but at this point I'm just gonna hard code it because I don't want another variable in the mix. So for fast ethernet zero on the server, <clears throat> I'm going to put in a static IPv6 address of 2001. I mean, if we did auto config, see, see that it got an auto address right there, but I also wanna make sure the default gateway works and everything. So I'm going to just pump it in. So it's going to be 2001, 6783. I can't believe it. I mean, I, I can believe it. And I'm glad it happened. 6783. If I was going to design a network problem, that's how I would do it. <laughs> it's like, well, this is going to be tricky to see based on who's sourcing the packet. 2001, 6783, DB, uh, I already messed that up. DB8, 6783, colon, one. That's the network. And this host address, let's put them at 10. I'm tabbing over, and that's a 64-bit network over there on the far right. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. So that's the network address. That's the, the mask length. And and to make this work, I'm also going to go up to settings. And for the default gateway that this client's going to use, I'm not going to bother auto-configuring that either. I'm going to go ahead and put in FE80 colon colon 1 because <laughs> that's the link local address that we hard-coded when we set up our one to begin with. So to test that, I am going to hover over R1, over R1, and that's not going to do it for me. So I'm going to go to the config and just show IPv6 interface brief. So I want to verify that that's the link local address. So that's the link local address. So this server that we just hard coded is going to use that link local address as its default gateway. That's the layer three address. And then behind the scenes, it uses neighbor discovery protocol to resolve the layer two address, doesn't use ARP.
but it should still function. Let's test that by going to the desktop of this PC and doing IP config, which, <laughs> how about IPv6 config? That's better. So there's its link local address. There's the address that we just assigned it, the global address. And there's its default gateway to FE80 colon colon one. And now let's do a trace. I'm almost afraid. So we'll do a trace out to, does that command work? No, trace, trace route, trace RT. Okay, great. They borrowed trace RT from a Windows machine. That's what they're emulating here. So we'll do a T-R-A-C-E-R-T space 2001 DB8 6783 network two. And let's go to, because I don't have this conf the PC configured yet with an IP address, let's go to the, the gig interface here on R2, which is, should be two. Let's just configure that, let's verify that real quick. So that gig zero interface, if we do a show IPv6 interface pre. All right, so that interface right there is this address. So let's try to do a trace from the piece, the server at the top left, all the way down to that gig zero zero interface. And it should go down the ethernet path, gigabit ethernet path from the PC to R1, its default gateway, to R3, who should make a routing decision, over to R2, and who should respond. That's what should happen, and that's, that's what we're hoping for. So we'll put a two for that last character. All right, if you're superstitious, now's the time to hope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so static routing for IPv6. The challenge is we did not, I did not have us design the routing for the links between networks. And so when we sourced a packet from R1, it sourced it from the 23 network, I'm sorry, the 13 network, and we had no static route on R2 that said it knew how to reach that. And as a result, we received those packets and thought, I don't know how to get back to that, and it dropped them. So now we have connectivity between the endpoints. So this one PC, this one server should be able to ping the three network. So that's the IPv6 address of R3's gig zero zero interface. And that's just going straight down one to three and mystery solves. Gosh, you know, it only could have been better by one notch and that's if I had planned this. <laughs> I was I was as surprised when this didn't work this time as I was when we had a, a, a switch with a VLAN interface and no default gateway when it could re reach a remote network. And that was because of the proxy ARP challenge. And this this time I just I just did not consider the source being this local network. An hour and thirty two minutes. What did you learn today, Keith? Well, <laughs> I learned that the packets don't lie. Uh, another thing we could have done was it, in a live environment, if we did packet sniffing on that traffic, we would be able to see the source address and say, oh, that's why this guy's, or we could do a debug on R2 when he's receiving that packet. And it would basically say that it didn't know how to reach the destination dropping the packet. <laughs> All right, I'm glad I didn't attempt to do the uh, backup routes as well with the floating static routes because that would have been a whole nother layer. But floating static routes is pretty cool because we can have an alternate route that if the primary link fails, then the backup route, the floating static route would kick in and away it would go. So our objectives in this live stream, which has been a lot of fun for me, and I had to put my thinking cap on to, to make it work. Uh, at one point I thought, okay, so confession. At one point I thought, oh, this is Packet Tracer. <laughs> this was not Packet Tracer. This is me. So IPv6 unicast routing was on. We had reachability from neighbor to neighbor. And what we didn't have was we didn't have the ability for um, reachability to those internal networks between the two routers. And that was the cause of the problem. All right, so I'd like to take a quick break. <laughs> Call my counselor. <laughs> I don't have a counselor. Uh, I'd like to take a quick break, grab a sip of water. And then if you have any questions regarding anything we've covered today, it's fair game. So I'd like to focus on anything with IPv6 static routing or anything regarding IPv6 specifically at the CCNA level, which involves things like what's a multicast, what's a global unicast, mm, how do you set up static routing, what are examples? What we didn't do here is we didn't do a default static route. A default static route is 
just like a default static route in IPv4. It simply says if you don't have a better match in your routing table, go ahead and forward it. In fact, if we had done that on the routers and give them all a default route, if they didn't have a better match, that would have solved this problem. If we had the default routes going in the right direction, that is. Also, OSPF version 3 would have solved this problem because OSPF would share the link state advertisements for all the networks with everybody in the area, and they would all figure it out and be able to route no problem. A couple things before I take a sip of water and then come back for Q&A. If you haven't already, please click on subscribe so you can check out more of this madness and this learning that we're doing collectively in, this set, in these live streams. Uh, it also goes to show you that a double CCIE sometimes forgets things. And I, you know, in the network design, I just in my mind as I built this with you, I just thought, yeah, we don't need to have routes to those internally. And if we're just going from PCs or the outside networks, the one and the two and the three, we wouldn't have. But when we start doing traces or pings without specifying a source interface or source address, it's going to use the interface closest to the destination based on the routing table. And if that route isn't in the routing table of some other device for the return traffic, there's no return traffic. So good lesson to remember. All right, so I'll see you back in just a few moments and we'll take Q&A. I'll see you back in just a bit. Life is a winding road No telling where it goes Driving through days and nights Won't stop for traffic lights And I All right, we got two things going for us. One, we're back for Q&A, and two, my mic is on. <laughs> Both very, very important. So going forward, if you're new to these Q&As afterwards, uh, if you could do me a favor, and that is if you have any questions where you'd like me to address them, I know we've had a lot of great responses and feedback from others. If you'd like me to go ahead and address it or answer it directly, just do it at Keith Barker, so it's selected my name and then your question. And that way it can show up starting now going forward and I can make sure I find them because uh, I, I won't have time to scroll all the way back through and, and dig them all out. So if you have a question that didn't get answered and you'd like me to answer it, um, this, that's the way to do it. Okay. Um, okay, starting off with Angelo. Welcome, Angelo. It's good to have you. In the issue that occurred, what happens if we try to ping from the server? We're facing the same issue in an IPv4 environment. And if we had pinged from the server, we would have been fine. And, and here's what we do in a production environment to test. And, and this is good for full connectivity test too. In production, what I would do is this. I would say, well, I wonder if I have reachability, says I. I wonder if I have reachability from this network, which is the, the one network, 2001 db 867831 down to the, the three network or the two network. If we do the ping like we just did or the trace, it sources it from the wrong interface or the, the closest interface. What we could do is we could source our ping or our trace route from this interface or from this IP address. And that would be capable in an extended ping or an extended trace route or a trace route with the, the source option. You can specify what you want the source IP address to be. And that way in the packet that goes out, it's sourced from the 10.1, from the 2001, from the one network, 2001 db 867831 and that way, when this router gets it, it has a route back and can send it. So for testing, you can source it from the actual local network. Now, is that supported in Packet Tracer? Let's see. So here in Packet Tracer, let's go to R1. And at the command line, I would do a ping to 2001. I'm just going to copy some of that. Copy, paste. Too many characters. All right. Ping 2001 db 68 We're going to three, or to two rather, on the far left. Colon, colon, two. That's the IP address of the gig zero zero interface on R2. And then we can say source. <laughs> and packet tracer saying no go. But on a live on live gear, you could use source and then specify the, either the source IP address, if you do context sensitive help, source IP address, and possibly the source interface, but source IP address will be enough. And when you specify a source, it then will source that packet. In this case, it would be a ping 
from that source address and then the reply could happen and you could verify end-to-end -end connectivity without having to worry about those links in between being part of the routing tables. Uh, the other option, maybe this will work. The other option could be typing in ping and then IPv6 and the address I should copy that first and then paste. And the repeat count, datagram size, timeout, extended commands. Yay. Well, maybe this is going to work. Then the, the source address or interface. So from here, we could put in copying to save a little bit of time there. 2001 db 8 This is from R1's perspective. It would be 1 colon colon 1. 1. <laughs> And that would be the source IPv6 address that we're going to use for this. And then we can just hit enter for the rest. <laughs> and it works because we're sourcing it from the right interface. If we did this, ping, and we just ping that same address. I'll copy and paste. Crickets. Now the trace that we did helped us realize that it was going to the first hop router, which was R3 because R3 responded with trace, it's actually using a time to live of one for the first three packets, then a time to live of two. So with the trace to that same destination, that was a great clue that our routing locally on R1 was working. Trace route. So right there, that's R3 saying, yep, got your packet, killed it, because the TTL expired for the next set of three packets. It then forwarded over to R2, and R2 says, I have no clue how to get back to network 2001 db 13 And that's why this is failing. Oh no, is it going to be forever? Is it, is it going to be forever? You know what? Because I think it goes till 30, control shift six. <laughs> you know how we can solve this? Let's add a static route on R2 that says, hey, here's how you get back to 13. Easy peasy, config T, IPv6, route. To get to two, actually, you know what? Let's do a default route. <laughs> to get to colon colon slash zero, which is the default route for IPv6. Go ahead and send it to your buddy 2001 colon DB8 6783 colon R3 is at 23 colon colon three. Just like that. Show IPv6 route. So there's our default route. And if we go back to R1, <laughs> now R2 knows how to get back and as a result is able to reply back because it's using now its default route that says, hey, anything I don't have a match, match in my routing table, a more explicit match, I'll use the default route. And the default route from R3's perspective, we just told, from R2's perspective, was R3. Um, now, throwing in a default route like that without planning it out, <laughs> not the best idea because if we just start throwing in default routes nilly-willy, we could have... R2 think the default route is R3, R3 think the default route is R1, R1 think the default route is R2, and just create a loop that way. And then the TTLs, as that packet gets looped around, would go down to zero, killed, and next packet would repeat for any, any networks that weren't explicitly reachable. It's like my dad told me. He told me a joke about when he was in the military. He served in the Korean War. He's 90. Very healthy man uh, now. And he said that, yeah, we had a... Our, the senior officer came in and said, you got good news and bad news. The good news is everybody gets to change the underwear. They're all, yay. And the bad news is, Bob, you change, <laughs> Bob, you change with Mark. Mark, you change with Larry. <laughs> that was a joke. Anyway, uh, default routes or routing that's not done well can cause loops at layer three. So thanks for that question on what if we'd pinged from somewhere else and both of those would solve our problem. Also, I just didn't mind a little reinforcement for that's how it works and it's not magic. There's, it's science. <laughs> no magic in routing. It's all just bits and bytes and science. So if something goes terribly, horribly wrong, it's um, oftentimes user operator error, which in this case it was mine, just not considering where that source IP packet was coming from for IPv6. All right, moving down the list. Thanks for the great comments and feedback. Uh, one question, does the IPv6, this is from Nicholas. Hey, Nicholas, glad to have you. Does the IPv6 unicache-routing command disable or influence IPv4 routing in any way? The answer is no, zero, nada, nilch, nothing. <laughs> so IPv6 unicast routing has zero impact on IPv4. 
as a protocol. Now, if we're doing something creative like six to four tunneling or something else where they have relationships and they're tunneling inside of each other, that's another story. But just by itself, IPv4, think of it like a whole world of IPv4 all by itself. And then IPv6 all by itself with its own routes and its own routing protocols, completely separate. And um, I thought I was going down the rabbit hole of IPv6 unicast routing because that's what it felt like when R1 could hit R2. No, when R1 could hit R3 and R3 could hit R2, I thought, well, they can see each <laughs> Why won't you route for somebody else? That's what it felt like, although those commands were on. We put them on, and they were on, and yeah. All right. Yep, both can exist simultaneously, Nicholas. IP, IPv4 and IPv6. So you could have IPv6 with OSPF. You could have IPv4 with RIP or EIGRP or OSPF or static routes, and they are like two ships in the night that don't touch. Great question. All right. Vidura is asking, what is the solicited mode multicast group? It's a good question. And uh, it's one that I'm not going to answer right now, but one that I love. And let me put it this way. ARP is used by IPv6 to discover a layer 2 address on an, a device in that same local VLAN. So with IPv6, they use multicast listener discovery and Th that option, the multi, the solicited node multicast group is used as a, a process to help discover the layer two address of another device on that same local subnet that we need to talk to. Uh, yeah, that's, <clears throat> so that's what, <laughs> it's kind of a long tell. Yeah, Vidura, if you are, mm, let me take a look at the blueprint real quick. My blueprint's in the other room. Will you excuse me for just one moment? Talk amongst yourselves. Let me go grab it. I want to see what level of detail is on the blueprint for that, if any. And that way I can justify going and elaborating on it a little bit more. Hold on one second. Okay, thanks. So in section one, subsection 1.8, configure and verify IPv6 addresses and prefixes, which is what we just did, and compare IPv6 address types, multicast, any cast, link local, unique local. So the multicast listener group uh, for multicast, probably not going to elaborate on it here, but if you want to hit me up in the Discord channel, I'd be happy to both give you a little enumeration on it and also some links that can help with it. Also, when I did the IPv6 course for CBT Nuggets many years ago, still valid, technology hasn't changed, uh, at least the content I taught. There's just It's just long. I mean, there's just so many videos on all these topics, and that also covers it in detail, including the mapping of the Layer 3 and the Layer 2. So if, you, if you have access to that and want to check that out, that would also be a resource as well. So that's section 1.8 and 1.9. And then in section 3, regarding IPv6, it talks about 3.3, configure and verify IPv4 and IPv6 static routing, including default routes, network routes, host routes, and floating static routes. We covered half of that today. And in the, static, <laughs> the default route also just a moment ago. And we'll be covering more on IPv6 as far as it relates to CCNA. So I appreciate the question, I do. And I'll be happy to enumerate on that or elaborate on that for you in Discord if you'd like. Great questions. Also, I shaved. <laughs> uh, one of the, I shaved for two reasons. One, my wife says she would prefer me to have a shaved face. And then secondly, I thought to myself, if I have a little few whiskers, it takes like, I don't know, two years for me to grow a little beard. I just, I, it's not very, I'm just not a very hairy guy. And so I thought to myself, I probably touch my face more if I have hair there. And it's true. You know, and, and so with this whole new coronavirus, I need to retrain myself to keep my hands away from my face until I wash my hands if we go in public. So I thought it'd be a, a, an, an easier way to help me avoid touching my face until the pandemic is boiled down. All right. 
Uh, oh, also news from Vegas. If you're, <laughs> my wife uh, sang. She was the one of the lead singers for Mystere, a Cirque du Soleil show that was at Treasure Island for over a decade. It's over five thousand shows. She was amazing. I saw it probably twenty five times, and it. Was, she's great. She's amazing. She's also an actor, and she got she semi retired in two thousand seventeen ish. 2018, 2017. Anyway, Oh called her back last year and said, hey, we're going to seven days a week, and would you mind coming back and filling in for some of that? I mean, Oh at the Bellagio. It's like, it's a great show. In fact, I like all the Cirque shows. They're a lot of fun. Last night, and I, I hope this is public knowledge. <laughs> I don't want to give it anything away. Last night, Cirque just made the decision they're shutting down all the shows in Vegas until the pandemic is reasonable. Because there's, you know, they have a theater of like 12, 12 to 2,000, 1,200 to 2,000 people. I forget how big O is, but that's a lot of people in a very tight space. And starting, I think their last show was last night. And all the Cirque shows, including Blue Man, which is owned by Cirque, those are all going dark until things calm down. That's a big deal. So my wife, <laughs> she was just, she was going a mile a minute. She was involved in a play. She was involved in uh, preparation for a reading, and she was also doing Cirque du Soleil, just going just heavy duty. All and then within one week, everything's canceled. No more Cirque for a while. No more plays. They got canceled because of the group meetings. And I went to I went to a, a, a store yesterday, like a big a big not big lots, but a what do you call it, warehouse store, and people were shopping, and most of the content was there, and. It didn't seem like an emergency, and I think we need to keep everything in perspective. Do what you can to keep yourself safe. It's possible that a lot of people are going to get infected, and a lot of people are going to survive it very well. And uh, anyway, it's crazy times. It's crazy times. So her schedule opened wide open, and I'm excited to see her a little more, actually. So if you're out there, Dina, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> from a personal personal perspective, I'm glad to have a little more time with you. Okay. Um, Umair is asking, I'd like to know how neighbor discovery, router advertisement, and solicitation messages work. Also, what's any cast? Um, Umair, let's do this. As far as those topics, which <clears throat> I may cover more of IPv6, I probably will based on the interest. Uh, let me just cover any cast for a moment. And then the others require longer discussions and replacement for things like ARP, which no longer exists. But any cast, let's imagine that we have a world and we have a server over on this side of the world and a server on this side of the world. And if maybe it's a DNS server or some other server and a client on this side of the world, which server would they be best to use? The answer is probably the one on this side of the world. <laughs> and something on this side of the world would probably be best served by accessing a, a server on this side because they're closer geographically and electrons travel at the speed of light and on wire, they get slowed down by they're like 0.8 times the speed of light. And then there's anyway, long story short, going to a local resource makes sense. So what if, from a routing perspective, we had the same IP address here and here, two different servers, but they both support the same IP address. And then based on where you are in the world, the routing would forward you to the what the routers believed was the closest of those IP addresses. Pretty slick, right? It's like, well, you can't have two IP addresses that are exactly the same. You can, <laughs> and that's how Anycast works. So with Anycast, you have two or more IP addresses or two or more servers that are supporting the same exact IP address. And then based on where you access that network from and how you're routed to it, the routing infrastructure, like the internet, would forward you to the one that they believed was the closest. So if you have a service provider that learned about 8888 over here and 8888 over here, but they believe this one is closer because it's the same exact route, the longest, you know, that would go in their routing table via BGP, and then they'd forward customers' traffic to that specific server at that address. So that's the concept of Anycast. And for anybody who wants to really deep dive into IPv6, uh, if you're a CBT Nugget subscriber, again, it's a paid service, it's not free, uh, but I do have that enormous series on IPv6 that goes into great detail on tons of these topics. I mean, probably a little overkill. I was curious about, <laughs> I was laughing it up, this was like seven years ago, and I had three various versions of w computers and they were handling the router advertisements differently. And so I made this matrix and let's test this one with this condition, with this, what's going to happen. And it took weeks for that, like this table to be built, but I was curious and I thought other people would be too. And so that that's available, but I will cover 
some more of the basics of IP6 in these streams as part of CCNA uh, here at free on YouTube as well. Okay, moving forward. Demetrio is saying, for me especially, um, um, it's asking, I think this from Demetrio is asking, how could we avoid to go into this type of troubleshooting? If if we were running a routing protocol like OSPF, this would be a moot point. <laughs> so in a production environment, things like this where you only have static routes is unlikely to happen because OSPF would include all those links and they would have full reachability. So this is most likely to come up in a, a small lab environment where you're not using a dynamic routing protocol and you haven't put in routes to every single network, which if we had, it would have solved it as well. But uh, if I was troubleshooting a production network and I looked at the topology, I would say, okay, great. Just like we did here, literally say, well, R1 can talk to R3. R3 can talk to R2. Those links work. The IP addresses are good. And I would just follow it and see where the chain breaks. And from the routing perspective, I just didn't consider the source address. <laughs> totally my fault. I just thought, and then when it hit me, I was like, oh no, he can't reach it. R2 can't reach that because it doesn't have that route, that network in its routing table. So step-by-step, step, build the network, test it out. And when I was doing my CCIEs many years ago, we used to set up tickle scripts, TCL scripts that would actually go through and like test all the networks. And that's one thing a person could do is you could write a script that would just go out and hit all IP addresses on each one of the subnets to make sure you had full reachability. We'd also do a debug IP routing. And that way later in the lab or later in our configuration, if we change something or put an access control list that broke our routing, we could see those routing tables change. Like, hey, these routes are being deleted. Why is that? <laughs> wait, wait, stop the truck. I didn't mean to do that. So that would be other options as well as you're building a network. But most of those are going to be in simulated environments where you're going to cause this kind of a problem. All right, moving on. Oh, Vidura is saying Control-Shift-6-X to break out of that. And it depends on the terminal emulator that you're using, but... You know what? I, I think I, tr did I not try control shift six X? Let's take a look. <laughs> let me, um, let's get rid of the default route here on R2. All right. And let's go back here to router one and just do that trace again. And then control shift six was giving me no love. Control shift six, letting go X. Oh, I wish that had worked. It might, you know, it might want to finish this one sequence then come back. Let's see here. Control shift six, X. Control shift six, X, X. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, you know, I'm making deals with uh, supernatural powers. Like, Please just break. Let me go ahead and get back into this. So if you use a terminal emulator like Secure CRT, there's these uh, individual break sequences. And it depends on how you're connected and what terminal emulator you're using. Also, if you're telneted or if you're connected to one device like R1, and then from there you connect to another device like R2, then it's an issue of Control Shift 6, let go, and then hit X. And you might need to hit X a couple times. So if in the video we did earlier, like maybe it was uh, it was last Sunday, we talked about DNS and the CLI and domain lookup and understanding your break sequences before you need them is very, very important. So the, yeah, Packet Tracer is not responding to any of that. Yep. Well, let me, let me do one more thing. It, uh, and that's this. It says control F6 to exit CLI focus. Uh, that's not going to help, I don't think, but let's, yeah. So normally in a terminal emulator, there's also an option to send a break or it has a special keyboard sequence, but this is just a, I did control C, which is on a Windows computer might work. Control shift six, control shift six a couple times. <laughs> yeah, not happening. All right. Fun times at the CLI, and that's why it's also, oh, you know what, can you do a packet tracer? Here's another option too that I wanna share with you about. Let's imagine that you're connected into packet tracer and you've, you've SSH'd into a device and you wanna to get to the console. What you could do is you can actually do a console cable from a PC. So this PC right here 
it, this cable right here, this little blue one. So click on the connector tool, go to the console icon. You say, I want to go from the RS-232 port. That's the old fashioned serial port to the console port right there. And then from this PC, we can just go to desktop, open up a terminal, select the default for the speed and duplex. And we are there. If you do a show users, that shows you where you're connected from. So this indicates that we're connected literally on the console. And Packet Tracer, also if we close this, and we went back to R2, and we did a show users. It also has us on the console by default. It's the same screen we had from the console port. So if you are SSH into a device, and you want out of band access or another method to connect to it, um, you could, if you're, if you're not already on the console, you could go ahead and just connect a console cable and, and go there. That would be another option as well. <laughs> it's unfortunate that we get locked up sometimes that doesn't let go. All right. Thanks for the recommendation, uh, Vidura. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Looking down the list at other questions directed at me. All right. Kashif is asking or stating, what tools do you use to make this video? Do you use tablet to make a diagram? Which software do you use for recording? Oh, here's opening the kimono. So I have a laptop right here. It's a gaming laptop. I have an external monitor here that's on USB 3. Well, it's a, yeah, it's USB 3, uses a C connector. USB C. Yeah. Yeah. USB 3 and a C type connect connector. Then I've got this monitor right here which I don't want to move the camera. Uh, what, what's happening here this is a Wacom 22 inch HD. It's just, it's like a 22 inch monitor, but it's uses the, it responds to the pen. So it has a USB connector to it as well. And so I can literally write on this or where I go with this pen. I'll show you is where my mouse goes. And then I just bring up a little pen tool if I need it like this. And then I can write on top of virtually anything. Uh, I need to change my pen. There we go. Pencil. It's like P E N C I L. Is that spelled right? I don't know. I can clear that off. So then I can go ahead and change colors and I can write on there. And that's what I use. So I've got this Wacom 22. They used to be really expensive and they're, they're a little pricey, but it's so valuable. If you're making online training or telestrating or communicating online, it's fantastic. And that's my whole setup, pretty much. And I've got a, a microphone. I've got this mic right here that is a little, I think it's like an $80 microphone. Uh, it's a Audio-Technica. I think it's the AT2020. And it's connected to a Scarlet Pimpernel. No, that's a movie. A Scarlet 2i2, I think it is. A little, it's a little uh, device that takes the input and puts it into my computer through USB. And then I've got this camera. I upgraded it about four weeks ago after I was so tired of not being able to get the effect I wanted. I want to make this fun and I want to make it fun for you as you watch this. So I increased my output to 1080 and I also bought this camera, which is a Sony A6400. And here's what I love about this camera besides my son, Paul. Uh, I got feedback from Network Chuck and other people about cameras and ideas. And this is a, the camera my son loves. He's a great photographer, great violinist, great pianist. If you haven't, look up Pollyano on um, YouTube and watch this video about, oh my gosh, let me just show you. This is, this is so amazing. <laughs> You're going to love this. Hold on a second. Let me uh, bring up a new window. Yeah, this is, uh, this is definitely worth a view. Let me make sure I can line this up so we can all see it. YouTube and 200 301. Oh, look at that. I'm live now. Hey, Keith Barker's live now. <laughs> How meta is that? Anyway, um, I want to do a search for Pollyano. P A U L, like my son's name, Paul, I A N O. And let's see what that brings up. Maybe I'm typing it wrong. Pollyano. Oh, there it is. Oh, okay. Right here. So that's what the icon looks like. He's got one video, but check this out. I'm just going to have this go through my external uh, monitor, uh, my external um, mic. He made this with a Raspberry Pi, a keyboard, 
and then a whole bunch of After Effects. He plays, he's an amazing pianist too, by the way. Let me turn up my volume. Yeah. Amazing. He's just amazing. So he's a great coder, great programmer. Uh, he plays violin. He does that. He can create that. So that's him actually playing. He's the Raspberry Pi for the actual lighting on the keyboards and then a whole bunch of special effects after. Amazing. I could I watched that like, I don't know. <laughs> How many views are on that video? They're probably half of them are mine. They're just it's just amazing. So Pollyanna, check that out if you want to have some fun. Where was I going with all that? Oh, I was talking about the software I use, screens, the software. I use OBS Studio. Mm, I use Streamlabs OBS, which is Streamlabs version of OBS for streaming. They have some great tools. It is mostly free. There's some add-ons you can buy there. Uh, I use uh, Moderate Lights, and uh, I just gotten better. So Network Chuck has been a huge inspiration for me. <laughs> I was listening to part of my live stream yesterday, and... I was talking about people that have inspired me to do better. And I said these words. I said, you know, uh, <laughs> it, it didn't go. When I said it, I, well, I said these words. I said, like, you know, there's people that just, I've seen people do amazing jobs like Network Chuck, and I know I can just do better. I thought, no, I'm not saying I could do better than Network Chuck. <laughs> I'm saying that I see people that inspire me, and I know I can do better. So I wanted to get that off my chest. It's like, wow, no, I'm not trying to beat Network Chuck. We're on different, you know. We're on different angles, different playing fields, but we both care about making sure people learn, but he's a lot younger than I am and he's amazing. So if you haven't joined Network Chuck yet or haven't checked his channel, please do so. Network Chuck, he's a great a great guy at CBT Nuggets, has a lot of good information to share. Also, if you'd like to see me in a video with him, tell him. <laughs> and I probably wouldn't say no. Uh, all right. Uh, hopefully he doesn't get like 100 people asking him all at once. Okay, moving forward, other questions. <clears throat> Let's see if I can catch up. Okay. Um, next one that I see is here. Can you explain the solution for this problem again? Absolutely. This is for Tiago. The challenge was, as we look at this topology right here, the challenge was this. <clears throat> Let me grab a pen. The challenge was that these routers, R1, R2, and R3, they all had routes to these networks. Here's the one network, here's the two network, here's the three network. They all had routes, meaning if they get a packet for any of those networks, they know exactly what to do, how to forward it, how to route that packet, and move on. However, what router two and the other routers don't know is, like router three does not know about this network, router two does not know about this network, and router one does not know about this network. And so when we sent the packet, whether it's trace or ping without any other considerations as far as the source address for it, it would send it from the interface that's closest to that destination, which because the route went this way, the closest interface was this gig interface right here. <laughs> and as a result, when it came into R2, R2 said, well, the packet's coming from 10, this is the 13 network. And there was no route in the routing table for R2 to reach the 13 network. And so it simply said, I give up. No default route, no match in the routing table for IP, for that network. I'm dropping it. So the solution would be that we include those net routes. Like we tell R1 about how to reach this network. We tell R2 how to reach this network. We tell R3 how to reach this net network. That would solve it. Or what we did to solve it in our case is we put a default route in R2 that said go this way. If you have a route, a packet that needs to go to a network, you don't know where it is, don't sweat it. Just send it to R3. That's your default route, and he'll take care of it from there, he or she. So that was the solution that we that we uh, finally came up with. <laughs> yep. Thanks for that question. 
Let me go ahead and clear that screen in the background and let's take a look at the next question. All right, Wizard TV. If you are new to the channel or not sure exactly what's happening, I would encourage you to start in the playlist, the master playlist for CCNA, start there. And also a subnet Sundays, which talks about IP addressing and so forth, or subnet Saturdays and start from there. So we got into the weeds a little bit in troubleshooting because we didn't have routes in place, but we've had other videos on routing for IPv4 and the concepts regarding routing for IPv4 also apply with IPv6. In this case, we're doing static routing, but Wizard TV, I'm glad you're here. Hopefully you'll hang in there with us and watch the entire playlist in order and, and, and uh, ask questions as you have them. Okay, next question is, do you have any tips on binary and or decimal conversions? I've, heard, I've had a hard time explaining to others what I do in my head because of years and years of doing bitwise programming. Michael Taylor, yes. Check out our two videos in Subnet Saturday on binary to decimal and decimal to binary translation conversion. And I walk through just the fundamental step-by-step -step, anybody can do it process. So Michael, that's where I'd go directly is to those two videos as part of Subnet Saturdays. Those are also in the master playlist if you wanna look at them there. But binary to decimal and the other one on decimal to binary, uh, they're both there. Thank you for the question. Yeah, it's tricky sometimes when we do things in our heads. I get it. Uh, we just like, oh, it's just second nature. But what I have the opportunity to do is I get to force myself to put myself back in the shoes of somebody who doesn't know it. And that way I can hopefully put all the pieces together for anybody who's just learning it. But it's not always as easy as it sounds. Okay, working down the list here. Great questions, great questions. Okay, Darshan, another question about IPv6 and IPv4 tunneling. <laughs> I'm going to save that for Discord. I'm going to keep on track here for this channel of CCNA. And uh, Nate, uh, the Encore certification, the Encore course at CBT Nuggets is being worked on, and it's a five person effort. So when it's finally done, CBT Nuggets will make a public announcement for that on mo most of the social media platforms. And I will too, to let you know it's ready. But I was hoping for the end of March, that doesn't look like it's going to be completely ready by then. So hopefully sometime, in, maybe sometime in April. Uh, again, I don't know because I'm not in charge of the final rollout of that. My pieces will be, my pieces will be done pretty soon. And uh, Michael's saying, my job canceled all travel. Now I'm required to work from home. A lot of people are doing that. So we're all going to have to adapt. I'm I'm also happy the internet's able to handle the load because it's a lot of additional streaming and conversations and video calls that are going on as a result. And Murray's asking, will you make this lab available so we can try it in PT? You know what? I've got it right here. Um, yes, the answer is yes. The question is, how would you like me to deliver it? You want me to clean it up a little bit? Yeah, let me do this. Yes, let me clean up the static routes that we put in so you have a base topology to work with, with R1, R2, and R3, with IPv6 routing enabled and no static routes, but all the IP addresses enabled. And let me give that to you guys uh, and gals, and that way you can have it. So what I will do is I will make that available later today on the website called thekeithbarker.com. <laughs> uh, so, and I... I have a link there for the wireless LAN controller packet tracer lab, and I will make one as well for this IPv6. I'll just call it IPv6 routing, and that way it'll be scratch. I mean, it'll be the basic foundation with IP addresses in place. You just add the routing. If you want to add IPv6 OSPF version three, it'll work there as well. So you can actually have practice with it. Michael, that's a, or Murray, that's a great idea. Thank you very much. I will make that. So it is, uh, 1.15 p.m. Pacific time on Sunday, <laughs> the 15th. And what I'll have you do is within 12 hours from now, I'll have that on my website. So whatever time that is in your in your time zone, it'll be there. Thank you very much for the request. Okay. Let's see here. Um, Angelo's asking, is there an Anycast address available for IPv4? Yes, Anycast and IPv4 works the same way it does in IPv... Well, it works very similar to how it does in IPv6. So if you'll notice that um, there's lots of different Google DNS servers out there. And so if you did a trace route to 8888, which is a Google DNS server, and somebody else does a trace route to 8888, it's not going to take the same path. 
And that's because it's often not the same grouping or, 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 or server farm of servers running DNS. They've got them all over the, all over the globe. <laughs> and I could be wrong, but my belief is they're using any cast for that because that 8888, they want you to go to the closest one to them to get that information, get that DNS information. Okay, Demetrio, you're welcome. Um, Dino's asking, what's a tickle script? Uh, it's just a way of scripting a bunch of commands and having them execute one after the other. That We're going to take a look at uh, Python and some other easy access methods for automating some of our network programmability and systems. And tickle script is just one TCL. It's called a TCL script and pronounced tickle script. And it's just a way of automating a bunch of commands that you want executed one after the other. <laughs> uh, awesome feedback from a lot of people. Oh, uh, okay. Michael Taylor is also recommending a different break sequence. Yeah. Uh, whatever that break sequence is, I, I should probably find out what that is in Packet Tracer so I don't have to wait for ever. And, and. All right. Let's see if there's anything else for me. Okay, Nason's stating, I have a problem with sh shift locking when using software on remote machines. Possible explanation is why the control shift six is not working. It's a Windows thing. Yeah, the, the key is on all those just to practice them before. <laughs> practice what you'll need to do before you get in the moment. And that way, when it comes faster, at least you'll know what that break, se break sequence is based on your terminal emulation software and what the Cisco is expecting. Because sometimes when you connect, it'll tell you, like you SSH to a router and it'll say, hey, the break sequence is, bah, it'll show you. And then not a bad idea to practice it and verify that it works. Okay, Murray is 59, still learning and loving it. Awesome, awesome. We have a lot of things to share, people who are over 40. And people who are under 40 have a lot of things to share. It's a, it's a great world we live in. And let's see, uh, looking for anything else that looks like a question with my name on it. And let me bring up this window just a little bit so I have to crank my, crane my neck. Is there a show command different than show run to see a floating static route? That's a great question, Angelo. Um, I think there's different ways to look at the, the RIB, the routing information base. So in a Cisco router, the winners, the routes that make it into the routing table, the top of the podium, those are the winning routes. They get in the routing table. The routes that aren't quite good enough are somewhere else. <laughs> and I don't know off the top of my head, I don't recall how to view those. If they're not like EIGRP, you could do a show IP EIGRP topology to see the successor routes. But it doesn't, I don't, I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head how to look at the RIB, the routing information base, or possibly the possible routes other than looking at the show run. If somebody else knows, please chat in. I would love to get that information back for Angelo. And Brian stating, thanks for using Packet Tracer and posting the topology later. It seems like I learned better when I'm able to, to follow along. Awesome. So I'll clean up this topology. I'll take off the static routes, and that way you can just start with the topology, watch this video, and just add the static routes, and have the same results we did if you try to ping from an interface that's not in the routing table of another router. <clears throat> okay. Yes, Mr. Vic is stating, do you think the transition to IPv6 has sped up or slowed down in the past few years? Seems like companies these days are more hesitant than ever to migrate. Well, I was at Cisco Live many, many years ago in Europe when I heard about the last block of IPv4 addresses being assigned to a service provider, and yet we still are using NAT, our IPv4 primarily. And we'll see. I mean, the trick is that you can take one IP address, a globally routable address, and logically, maybe not theoret theoretically, Maybe not practically, but theoretically you can pack 64,000 and change addresses behind that one. And then what if you took that one address and then you later down the road did port address translation again for another 64,000 addresses? You with me? <laughs> so one IP address mul done with a port, port address translation multiple times could support 
hundreds of thousands of different IP addresses. So as long as that keeps on going, you know, there might not be a big, you know, 10 IPv6 has been out for a long, long time. And I went to Europe about, I guess it was 2010. And I did some training on IPv6 for a huge telecom company there. We were in Vienna and we were in Amsterdam and doing these training sessions for this large service provider. And we trained, they, they had a like 15 to 16 people at a time that we trained. And it was all ranges, just people, the network architects and the network technicians and the service desk people, they all wanted to have this insight. And in spite of all the work that's been done, <laughs> I don't know when it's ever going to kick over. At, at eventually it has to, I would think. But in the meantime, um, IPv4 is still the dominant IP protocol on the internet today. End of story. And so when that changes, I'm happy to see that migration. And the security's got to improve as well with RA guard, router advertisement guard, and things like that for IPv6 so that people don't abuse that protocol like we've abused IPv4. So with IPv4, we have a lot of known attacks like man-in-the-middle attacks, ARP spoofing, lying about DNS information, and so forth, and many of those same types of attacks. But now in the IPv6 flavor, have to be protected against as well. All right. AJIN007-1981. Thanks for the session on IPv6. Really hard time to work due to lack of understanding for IPv6. Yeah, Nat is the savior of IPv4. What I'll do is I will carve out, I just realized after we did all this that um, probably a warm-up video on IPv6 basics, including global addresses, link local addresses, uh, some of the uses of multicast, neighbor discovery protocol, would be a good thing. So I, I've added that to my list mentally and I will place that in the master playlist before this one. So when we do that live stream, it'll be a lot of backfill on some of the basics of IPv6 so that when you see it, when you feel it, when you're working with it, you can be more comfortable with it. And then we, when we do the static routes, um, hopefully I can reinforce that as well. And Murray's asking, I, or stating, IoT will make the change to IPv6. I, I'm I'm game. <laughs> so whenever whenever they decide to do it, whenever the majority of devices and service providers support it, it'll be a wonderful thing. For now, sometimes it's interesting that when DNS doesn't work, if you have a service provider that's supporting IPv6, a lot of our computers are running IPv6 accidentally, meaning I wasn't intending to run IPv6, but it is. And so if a service provider and your default, your router supports IPv6, when you're doing DNS requests, you could be getting responses back for IPv6 and IPv4, and then your computer could be you know, choosing the one it wants based on the protocol it's using. But what I do is that if I, if I don't want to use IPv6 in my home network or in my office, I will consciously go to the configuration of that interface and turn it off. And that way I'm not wondering how is this working or how is that working or who am I registering with. I can just disable the IPv6 protocol, and that way I'm sure I'm not using it. As an attack vector, it's fantastic because people are running IPv6 and they're running two uh, dual protocol stacks, IPv4 and IPv6. They're not even aware of it. If that's the case in an organization that has those two protocols running, that IPv6 could be an attack vector used to get access to that computer if nobody's thinking about protecting that IPv6 address space. And Angela is saying, are you using a gaming laptop? Are you a gamer? I am not a gamer. I, my, I have a couple of kids that are gamers and they're, I, I can't say how good they are, but they are definitely gamers and they love it. And I, I, I dabble. I'm more of a a, twi uh, a Switch guy, a Nintendo guy, and I, I do have an Xbox. I do have a PlayStation. I haven't used those in a while. I used a uh, Switch occasionally, the new Nintendo one. A lot of fun. And uh, as far as the laptop, I just wanted something that would be good for live streaming and functionality. So it has the G the NVIDIA processor, the GPU in it, and it's got 32 gigs of RAM so it can handle whatever I need to throw at it, including virtual machines and so forth and drive the other monitors. And also I can take it with me. So if I go to Oregon for Trainer Palooza, for I'm traveling, I, I can't make, and it's not realistic for me to make CBT Nuggets content while I'm traveling because I just, there's too much gear nowadays. It used to be <laughs> one mic, one computer, go. And now we have a few more entrapments. Uh, so, but I do like to take my laptop with me after a full backup and be able to take it on the road. That way I have access to all my stuff and my normal email and everything else through that laptop, which is really handy. And 
Oh, thank you, Tiago. Hey, it's been great having everybody. Our live stream schedule is as follows. Please click on subscribe if you haven't already and get alerts when they come out by hitting the alert bell. And the live streams are Wednesday. These are all Pacific time. Wednesday at 4 p.m. It's going to be a CCNA related topic. Saturdays at 11 a.m. Pacific time. That's until we finish subnetting. That's going to be an IP addressing and subnetting type of scenario. Last Yesterday, we covered supernetting or network summarization. Same concept. And then um, on Sundays, we have CCNA Sunday, which is another CCNA topic. And I'll, I'll queue up a few more IPv6 streams as well to bring us in more gradually to the world of IP6, make sure we're comfortable with it, what to look for. Maybe talk about a little bit about the multicast listener discovery and how that maps out and how multicast is used by routing protocols as well, just so you have an idea of where that fits into the picture. And... Uh, Darshan, you're welcome for building. Darshan said, thanks for building the topology from scratch and showing us how it's done. You're welcome. You're welcome. I, I appreciate the opportunity to do it. So I look forward to seeing everybody in another stream. If you, if you know other people that are studying CCNA or you know other people that want to hang out for you know a while and help other people who are learning CCNA or hang out and just refresh their understanding or memory of how things work, also see Keith troubleshoot things on the fly that he wasn't anticipating. This is the second major one of something that I wasn't anticipating that we were able to solve while on camera, which is always helpful. Uh, and there was a learning experience. So I learned, we all learned, we had a good time and I'm grateful for that as well. So I'll see you in the next uh, video or live stream. Meanwhile, have a really, really great rest of your weekend unless it's, unless the weekend's over and whatever time zone you're in. And uh, in either case, I hope to see you in a future video or live stream. Thanks everybody.